What fan theory do you 100% accept as true? Not sure if this counts, but Donkey from Shrek being one of the kids from Pinocchio who turned into a donkey is pretty mind-blowing. Edit thanks for the award. First one ever. Kevin Malone, if not actually a genius, is certainly much smarter than he lets on. Clearly he's lazy, and gluttonous, and blah blah blah. But after the merger with Stanford, and it's revealed that Martin had served time, Kevin realizes that he needs to give plausible Dean ability to any sort of financial maleficence that the accountants have been doing, and flanderizes himself in front of the camera. Occasionally he slips up and reveals himself to be something a math genius, and has to backtrack and play it off as some kind of food-based idiot savant. It's how he was able to afford ownership of the bar at the end of the series. I'm sure he made a bit just cashing in all those free drinks. But actually enough to buy a bar. I don't believe it. There's a theory I read that the Kelvin number he used in accounting was solely so he can embezzle funds out of Dundla Mifflin while keeping up his Dumbus persona. Then he used said money after he was fired to buy the bar and made that free drink story to cover it all up since he knew that the documentary crew would come back for a reunion. The reason each It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia episode starts with a date and time is because they are all testifying against each other in court. The Empire Strikes Back Admiral Ozil is a rebel spy. Everything Ozil does in his brief bits of screen time is to the detriment of the Empire. When the probe droid finds the rebel shield generator, Ozil tries to dismiss it as smugglers before Pete speaks out of turn and gets Vader involved. Later, Ozil orders the fleet out of hyperspace to quickly, giving the rebels plenty of time to activate the aforementioned shield generator that Ozil knew about. Clumsy as he is stupid or rebel sympathizer who gave his life to give the Alliance as much time to evacuate their base as possible. I side on the latter. Thank you. I thought I was the only one who picked up on this. He has no legitimate reason for deflecting suspicion away from Hoth. Unless he is a spy it is utterly irrelevant to his position. If a junior officer raises a bad idea to the boss against his own judgment. To say nothing of it being hazardous to question, said boss when he's off on one of his headstrong impulses. Ozil is a hero of the rebellion. Beavis and Butthead have fetal alcohol syndrome. Marty McFly develops the inability to back down when called chicken in the second movie and on because in the first film, he creates a timeline where his father has confidence, changing the parenting style of his own background. Jessica Fletcher killed all those people and framed others for it. No way that a lady just happens to be involved in a murder every week. That Loki was controlled by the Tesseract more than he let on. His eyes glowed multiple times, and he shed a tear when Thor tried to talk sense into him. Fits with mythology Loki a bit better where he's a troublemaker and a bit twisted but isn't evil. If anything, he suffers from a flunza where he doesn't understand that other people face real consequences, whereas he doesn't, because he's a god. It also allows them to hand wave his turn to good. Miguel and Tulio may not be gods. But the armadillo that follows them around absolutely is. It's just helping them out because they saved it from being eaten. Bibo. I agree. When the volcano is going off he is chasing a butterfly. And then when Tulio yells stop, Bibo stops chasing the butterfly as well. It even keeps cutting to Bibo during their conversation. Another one is his ability to walk on walls and change direction midair during the game. And him accidentally helping come up with a plan for the boat at the end, amongst other things. In Disney's Ratatouille, the old lady in the beginning of the movie living in the house next to the river is the food critic, Anton Ego's mother. In the flashback scene, where he eats the Ratatouille you can see similarities of the house from the beginning, her face and I think the bridge. That explains Remy being able to make the Ratatouille that tasted exactly like his mother used to make. The town from Footless is the same town from Tremors. The ban on dancing wasn't a puritanical attempt to control the youth. The town elders were aware of the graboid threat and banged dancing out of the fear that it would cause rhythmic vibrations waking up the creature sleeping below the town. Kevin Bacon's character in Footless stayed in the town, growing up to be his character in Tremors, at which point he has to try and contain the danger he inadvertently released. 
There were so many problems with this but. Man. That's hilarious. As a massive Tremors fan this made me laugh. Thanks for sharing. The Jetsons and the Flintstones are living at the same time in a dystopian future where the Haves live above the clouds and the have-nots are stuck on a wasted earth. The signs include that Flintstones celebrate things like Christmas and other holidays which doesn't make sense and the great Gazoo alien appears in both series. Gazoo is in the Jetsons. Username checks out. In the final two-parter of Capaldi's run on Doctor Who Missy makes a joke that the Doctor's real name is Doctor Who. This isn't a joke and Missy is being truthful. The Doctor originally called himself Doctor Who, but got embarrassed by it later in life shortening it to the Doctor to sound better. This is why the actor playing the Doctor is usually credited as playing Doctor Who. James Bond's primary purpose is to be a distraction, to keep attention off the spies who actually spy. Villains and other spies know him. He rarely takes an alias. He makes his presence known early on and keeps messing up operations for the villains. But other spies have already infiltrated their ranks and work, while Bond does as much visible damage as possible to keep the others safe. I like this one. When you think about it, he's a pretty bad spy. Little late to the game. But the theory is that the Kyber crystal in Luke's green lightsaber is the same one from QUI Gonjins. After Kenobi defeats Darth Maul with his master's lightsaber, he would have kept it as a keepsake. Despite rebuilding his own saber, it's likely he would have retrieved it and kept it with him after the Order 66 attack. After the Empire takes over, they destroy all artifacts and memory of the Jedi in their purge of changing the history. And most kyber crystals go towards powering the Death Star. Because of this, any lightsaber crystal would have been very difficult for Luke to find after he loses the Skywalker saber. But we know he returns to Tatine to complete his new lightsaber, likely returning to Ben Kenobi's home for components, where he would have found Qui Gonjin's lightsaber and recycled its crystal. I vaguely remember reading it might have been Shadows of the Empire. Come to think of it, that Luke did go back to Ben's hut to study and get supplies. This makes a lot of sense. The monsters encourage the cowardly dog are regular people, but see monstrous from Courage's perspective since he's cowardly. Also they live in the middle of nowhere, because his owners never take him out so that's how he views the world. Red Alert 1 feats a light victory results in the Red Alert 2, 3 universe. Red Alert 1 feats Soviet victory leads to the Tiberium universe, debunked by the writers themselves, if I remember correctly, but that's how it'll always be for me. Isn't Kane one of Stalin's advisors in the Soviet campaign? The Soviet ending explicitly mentions the Brotherhood, and that they would tire of the USSR in the early 1990s, which is when the Tiberium series starts. There's a video on YouTube that goes into all the possible timelines, based on the victor in each game. And I think it was mentioned that Ra was originally meant to be a prequel to Tiberium. Ra 2 starts, based on an allied victory in Ra 1. As the Soviets are not in power, and there's no GDI, I'm not sure if the devs ever denied it, but it's certainly how the timelines play out. Every Star Wars planet is like a quarter the size of Earth how else does each planet have just one biome? I watched Mandalorian with my brother, who was never much into Star Wars and he's like, aren't they supposed to be going to the other side of the planet? And they're going by, speeders. Glinda dropped Dorothy's house on the Wicked Witch of the East, not the Tornado, and uses her to gain control of ants. One of the first things Glinda tells Dorothy is that she killed the witch. They praise her, so she'll accept it. And when the Witch of the West comes along, who killed her sister? Dorothy. Glinda then puts the ruby slippers on Dorothy's feet, but does not tell her that she can use them to geo her. Instead, she sends Dorothy to Oz in possession of objects that a witch would murder her for. Dorothy, being forced into a situation where her only salvation is Oz and her worst enemy is the queen inadvertently exposes the wizard of Oz as a fraud and murders the witch of the west. Now, who's left to rule Oz? Glinda Duck in Witch of the North. She used Dorothy as an expendable pawn to gain control of Oz without having to leave her bubble. And when Dorothy is done up having the two biggest powers in Oz, Glinda sends her home and makes her think it was all a dream. She came down in a bubble. Doug, they were sisters. The real world in the Matrix movies is just another layer of the Matrix. 
designed specifically to appeal to people unwilling to conform to the normal matrix. Humans in this outer matrix have confirmation of their belief that something was wrong and get to indulge in the fantasy of being a heroic freedom fighter against the faceless evil machines. Thus choosing to accept this false reality. The anomaly of the one is that he's capable of rejecting both realities. Which is the reason why he had powers in the real world. Yeah did revolutions ever address this? I thought the cliffhanger ending of Reloaded was meant to reveal that the real world was just another matrix. Pokedex entries are written by young trainers. When a professor sends a bunch of 10 year olds out into the world to document Pokemon. Of course the research can't be expected to be professional in the least. This is how we end up with the creepy legends of ghost Pokemon that might have been passed around as playground rumors. Or impossible facts like Makago being hotter than the actual Sunday. There's no reason why out of all the Pokemon professors, one of them couldn't have revised their dex information and correct the tidbit about Pidgeot breaking the speed of light or Gardevoir were creating black holes or Blazikens jumping over 30 story buildings. It's likely they leave the kids to their own devices without bothering to fact check. And kids, being kids, are going to exaggerate. I 100% believe the two men accompanying the woman in the original Blair Witch Project planned and successfully executed a plan to murder her while they were deep in the woods. Too many factors point to good old fashioned murder than a supernatural occurrence. Edit I'm referring to the characters of the film. Not the actors realized my language might be a bit ambiguous. The trolls from Frozen kidnapped Christopher. In classic Scandinavian mythology, trolls would take infant babies and replace them with their own. If I remember correctly the human parents would then raise the baby long enough to realize it was a troll and the human child would be put into slavery by the trolls. When Christoph and Sven are discovered following the trolls, they are found and that one troll says I think I'll keep you she meant it. That's also why we never hear anything about Christoph's real family. Considering all of the detail and research this needed while making Frozen I 100% believe this was intentional. I have one of my own. Nuffy's mother Joyce's brain aneurysm occurred indirectly because of Dawn. Not through magic or anything directly supernatural. But she was Dawn's mother and therefore she would have the most artificially created memories conception. Pregnancy, life, thoughts, fears, etc. This caused so much real physical change to her brain overnight that it created real medical problems and killed her. This is never hinted at at all in the show. Rob Stark died twice. First in his own body and second in grey winds. He had a chance to see error moments before his death. That the book Rory writes in the Gilmore Girls revival is the original show that explains why the characters are so different from the show versus revival miniseries. She's looking back at the past with rose-colored glasses. It would also help explain any unrealistic aspects. For example, eating 1000 pounds of fat and sugar every week. Splurging on ridiculous things at the same time you're talking about having budget problems. Claiming to have watched every movie and read every book 100 times, while being incredibly busy with life. This is Rory exaggerating for her book, or misremembering when anecdotes took place. Same with How I Met Your Mother. If the show is someone talking about their memories, you get a convenient way to explain inconsistencies and other nonsense. The cases in Sherlock are all fake. Orchestrated by his brother Mycroft. To keep him away from drugs. Event Horizon is a prequel to the Warhammer 40k universe. King of the Hilldale knew about Nancy and John Ridcon, but feigned ignorance, both to keep his home life stable, and because he knew Joseph would be raised as his son rather than Ridcorn's. She cheated. Hank. I knew about Nancy and John Ridcon. I knew about them the day Joseph was born. But every day since he was born I've been taking my revenge. That boy. He loves me Hank. He loves me. Love that John Ridcorn will never get. He'll never hear his own boy tell him that. Joseph will go to his grave loving me and never so much as looking in John Ridcorn's direction. His children. His grandchildren. They'll love me too. Hank. And they'll never even know John Ridcorn existed. That's revenge. Hank. Just like when the former Soviet Union resurrected Lenin to cause the housing crisis in America in revenge. Anon 90,319,350. 
4chan, 2017. I read this in his voice. Amazing. Willy one can knew what he was doing. There was no seat for Augustus aboard that boat. He knew Augustus loop would fall in there. Oh yeah this is absolutely true. It's why each kid had their own downfall specifically programmed into the tour. That's why he seemed bored by the end too. He was just weeding out the kids that weren't worthy. It's been a while since I watched it, but did they ever get to want to test Charlie? The fizzy lifting drinks thing was Uncle Joe being a bad influence wasn't it? I don't think that was meant to be Charlie's downfall. Otherwise how was there still room for him in the tour past, that and what not. This also brings up the end game of the movie into question though. Was there a challenge meant for Charlie we didn't see, or was it actually just giving back the gobstopper? Slugworth was going to pay handsomely for it, so I assume if poor Charlie gave it back to Wonka, that was him passing his test. The fizzy lifting drink just pissed off Wonka I guess. That was never supposed to happen I don't think. The fizzy lifting drink thing was Uncle Joe being a bad influence wasn't it? I don't think that was meant to be Charlie's downfall. Otherwise how was there room for him past that and what not? Charlie and Grandpa Joe don't even drink the fizzy lifting drinks in the book. It was added in the film. Wonka probably knew that Charlie was the right person. Charlie lived right near the factory. Wonka was probably spying on him the whole time. Edit something else I just realized. Charlie is not the one who picks the candy bar that holds the winning ticket. The candy shop owner picks it for him after Charlie says he's buying it for his grandfather. A selfless act. This is also the nearest candy shop to the Wonka factory. And the owner grabs it off a shelf directly behind him where no customer could reach it. Spoiler for American History X ahead. I don't know if this is a fan theory, but I always believed the boy that shot Danny was the younger brother of the guy Derek Kerb stomped and killed. That kid exacting revenge on his brother's killer by murdering the killer's brother speaks volumes in my opinion. It also ties in beautifully with Danny's final speech about hate being baggage. So I always accepted that to be 100% true. Ed from Ed Ed and Eddie is mentally stunted. Which is why he's one of the dumber characters in the show despite appearing older than the other two Eds he's about as tall as Kevin and Ralph. Who are some of the oldest kids in the cul-de-sac. Also that his parents are abusive to him because of his mental handicap literally removing the stairs when he was grounded. And his sister's attitude towards him is learned behavior from their parents. This is further reinforced by him living in the basement. Having non-existent hygiene habits and retreating into obsession with TV and Seafee comics. In fact, the other two Eds come from troubled homes as well, which is why they are social outcasts in the cul-de-sac. It's been heavily implied that Ed's parents knew his older brother was physically abusive to him and let it happen. Meanwhile, Double D's parents spend zero time with him and won't even directly communicate with their son, choosing instead to leave him notes for chores instead. Mr. Bean is an alien. That would explain his weird behavior and why he falls out of the sky at the beginning of every episode. Alright sit tight. Here goes. Giovanni is Ash's real father. Once a Pokemon trainer himself. Giovanni set on his journey and found his biggest catch of all Delia. Giovanni was living a double life however. One Delia didn't know about one she didn't want to know about. On one side Giovanni was quickly climbing the ranks of Team Rocket. On the other, he was climbing the ranks of love and impregnated Delia. Ash was born. But it didn't help Gio and Delia's relationship. Giovanni started coming home in the middle of the night. Stopped kissing Delia goodnight over time. And barely acknowledged Ash. Giovanni said he was providing. But Delia didn't want any of it. She gave Gio a choice the family or Team Rocket. Gio said it simply wasn't that simple. He couldn't throw it all away and said you don't want to know what I had to do to put this roof over our head. Delia, crying on the floor told him I love you, but I can't have you around Dash with your lifestyle. And Giovanni left. Ash never remembered anything about Giovanni, but over the years Gio and Delia still kept in contact as Giovanni sent money every month to provide for the two. This situation wasn't ideal, but it's what it had to be. Q Ash age 10. And by now Giovanni is the head of Team Rocket. Delia calls Gio one day and says Ash is about to start his Pokemon journey. 
but she worries about sending their son out into the world. Giovanni comes up with an idea. Giovanni took two of his low-level people Jesse and James and told them to oversee Ash's journey. They were to help him train make him think he's in trouble, but never actually have anything come of it. It was years since Giovanni seen his son. And Jesse James reported that Ash had been making some real progress. With this in mind, Giovanni set up scenarios for Ash to beat Team Rocket so he could actually see his son. We see this happen at points like Rocket Idiot and Sylph Co, where Ash a mere 10 year old boy overcomes the most powerful criminal organization in the country, and even its leader. All of these instances grow Ash's confidence and ability as he thinks he has slain Giovanna's best efforts when really all he has slain is a proud father's heart. Greg Hethelai is a sociopath. <laughs>